church worshiping as a congregation together, together isn't it? And um, by God's grace, the uh, restrictions will fade away during this year, but uh, we can't be certain of that. All right. <clears throat> um, thank you for your introduction, um, Richard, who is down there. And uh, thank you for your prayer, uh, Gideon, supporting my uh, delivery of this sermon. And, uh, but I feel right now I need to, uh, to pray per purposely and personally, <clears throat> which I will do. Lord in heaven, we all trust in you. We all enjoy your grace. And uh, <clears throat> I just pray that it will be your spirit uh, issuing the words from my mouth and uh, helping uh, every person present to, to hear of the, of the wonderful the wonderful relationship they can have with you. Thank you for your spirit's presence. In Jesus' name, Amen. Works and faith. It sounds like a... Uh, um, a heavy topic, and it was very interesting that um, David Billow, who led the preliminaries in Sabbath School this morning, um, touched on this subject, and uh, it's almost like a parallel uh, message. Um, but uh, <clears throat> I hope that by uh, looking at this, uh, that uh, we get a new look at something that's like an old hot potato. Um, it's right from the beginning, what do we normally talk about when we're talking about these things? We're normally talking about faith that works. But I've tried to draw attention to the fact that it, it's, it's works of faith as well. But uh, one of the interesting um, things that's been happening, um, my wife and I don't watch a lot of television, we watch hardly any commercial TV, and uh, just occasionally during the week we'll turn the, uh, what some people call the holy television on. And the Hope Channel of the recent weeks have been um, playing a series of um, um, sermons by Dwight Nelson at the, uh, at the uh, what's it called, the Pineapple Memorial Church in, um, in uh, where the general conference is, where Andrews University is. And uh, some of these are really good. But just last week, there was a, a particular sermon where he, well, these are repeats from 2017, but he had only just received a book, this book. <clears throat> so I wanna, uh, he only just received it and read it and was incorporating some of the amazing things in this book into, uh, into his sermon and uh, into a series of sermons. But um, if anyone can download it, it's free to download. It's, he's a Seventh-day Adventist uh, pastor. He's a, uh, uh, a writer. He's in German, speaks in German, and all these have been uh, translated. But on that website that's on the screen right now, um, you can download it in any of about 40 or 50 languages. It's been translated into all those different languages. It's an important recent work, Steps to Personal Revival. And uh, I, haven't, I haven't read very much of it. My wife has read a lot of it and read things out to me and I've been impressed to the point of adjusting my sermon here to um, incorporate some of the, the beginning thoughts in this, in this what amazing work. So, uh, here we go. Um, the first thing, of course, to, to think about when you're talking about personal revival is, what is it you believe in? What is it that can motivates you? What, what draws you into a relationship with the Lord? I would venture to suggest it's your, it's your salvation. The, uh, the very, um, the very, uh, uh, the very act of Jesus 
you knowing that Jesus died for you, that God loves you, um, exemplified by John 3.16. Who can say it? Everyone can say it with me, I hope. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Is that you? Is that you, everyone? No, praise the Lord. But the verse after it is very interesting too. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The whole plan of salvation is, is in place so that people out of God's love can actually accept it. And uh, it leads to conversion. How do you think when you were converted? Was it to saving grace of Jesus? Some people are, um, you know, we all discover that along the way, but some people are drawn into Bible prophecies and, uh, and amazing coincidence or links between different parts of the Bible and history. And that's all very, very good. But at the end of the day, the central message has to be saving grace in Jesus. So Jesus and conversion is, is a beautiful experience. Paul writes about it in Colossians, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. I hope, looking at the next verse, we don't need to read it out aloud, because we've been studying it in our Sabbath school in the last... Um, three or four weeks. That wonderful prophecy in Isaiah 53, well, we haven't got to Isaiah 53, but the, the, the Jesus prophecy coming out of there, he was wounded for our transgressions. All of these things were for us. By his stripes we are healed. And we can scan through there to the next little part of it, um, which ends up being, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Amazing. This is the plan of salvation. And um, Gideon referred, Pastor Gideon referred last evening, no, sorry, it was Kathy Bannister who mentioned that we had been studying uh, the book of Leviticus on Wednesday evenings uh, through much of last year uh, using a Zoom connection. And uh, I vocally declared last night, that's actually quite exciting in the book of Leviticus to discover the plan of salvation, that Jesus is there, God's plan of salvation is, shines out of the book of Leviticus when you look for it and ask the Spirit of the Lord to show you. And another great verse, which is probably one of my favourite verses in the Bible, is Paul writing to the Romans, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Do you identify with that, everyone? The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. These wonderful positive experiences are there. So um, those are, that's the centre of the faith in relationship that the Lord gives us. But very soon, or after a little while, we, we get tangled up with works, doing good works, and they seem to be part of it. And um, what are we talking about here? <clears throat> and there have been huge divisions in the church down through many years. <clears throat> Not just the Adventist church, but Christian church generally, as to how important works are in the big picture of, of, um, of Christian experience. Here, in 1953, this gentleman, Mr. Stedman, was quoted in some Adventist literature is saying, no issue is more clearly drawn than that which separates the camp of the legalists from the adherents of grace. This is 
still with us? Is the problem still with us? Do we get it right? It's, it's quite an amazing thing. And look back, Paul was trying to sort it out in New Testament times. Moses was trying to sort it out in, in Old Testament times. And um, even right back in, in Genesis chapter 3 and, and 4, um, particularly, yeah, anyway, when um, Adam and Eve bought uh, Cain and Abel, that's really the beginning of all this, the difference in the attitude to God of Cain and, and Abel centered around what they needed to do for, for the Lord. But the interesting thing is we're encouraged to do good works, aren't we? Do you feel that? We're encouraged to do good works. We're created for good works, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. And in Titus he says, in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. Have you ever noticed that we will be judged by our good works? Here in Revelation 20, um, and here, here John, the revelator, sees a great big vision in his head, and the dead, sorry, that's right, and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. And the sea gave up its dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered the dead to them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. So I would imagine that you uh, would think that, well, when they are, what it, it says, what we do as a result, as a result of our Christian experience, what we do is important. Um, even the disciples um, came to Jesus in John chapter 6 and said, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? What shall we do? Do you ever feel like that? What do I do as a result of, of, um, of God's love for you? I can say that for me, you can say it for you. What much in um, Jesus, three of the Gospels talk about Jesus' story, or well, it was a true story, of a rich young ruler who comes up to Jesus, runs up to Jesus and says, Master, what must I do to be saved? Do you come with that sometimes? Do you identify with that? What must I do to be saved? And uh, so here are the disciples closer to Jesus, um, exposed to some of his um, teachings, but not, not yet understanding it, and they're saying, what shall we do? But the other side of this works thing is... Um, but we are all like an unclean thing, and our righteousness are like, filth, are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Have you ever noticed that <clears throat> we tend to judge um, other people um, by the good or the bad works that they do? We can't see what's going on in their heart, so we naturally judge them based on the, uh, on the works that they do. That might be accurate, that may, could more likely not be accurate. Um, whoever noticed that there is, a, you might have a tendency, I might have a tendency, or people you know closely might have a tendency to um, take pride in the works we do. You know, we, we start to think that um, uh, well, these good actions will, will help me, will help us in our, in our walk with the Lord and when we're judged in that great and final day. But um, Romans 3.23, of course, says, for all have sinned and fall short. In other words, we, we all have a great need um, of, of salvation. And James uh, throws petrol on the fire by saying faith without works is dead. 
Now, um, if you don't, if that's all you ever read, you probably think that that's the, the end of the story. But the uh, James is actually presenting works as an important outcome of, uh, of our Christian experience. So if someone has summarised James chapter 2, where all of this, we could read James chapter 2, but I don't think we have time. But this little quote, it is fruitless for us to say that we have faith if our faith is not demonstrated by good works. Agree? Yes. It, it doesn't get us anywhere. Um, and what sort of good works are we talking about here? Um, uh, sorry, we'll get on to that shortly. A well-known verse off from the other side of the picture is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. There's a polarisation of, of, of little teachings on this subject. So, um, James chapter 2 does mention the type of good works that, that he's talking about here. Um, by mentioning the story about a brother or a sister who is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you just tries to say, oh, you're sorry that you're, you're in this situation, depart in peace and be warmed and filled. But if you don't help them, um, what does it profit? The person loses, probably is, has a weakened relationship with you or the church you belong to, and, um, and still has a need. Meeting people's needs is what it's about. In Matthew 25, a large part of the chapter is talking about these people that will be judged as righteous or not righteous based on what they've done, and they've done it out of the love of their hearts. Uh, for, and he says, um, For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And, and the, the king who's hearing this says, um, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, these people you helped, you did it to me. In other words, recognising that all the people out there and all the people in our circle of life are um, uh, people created by God and uh, God, potentially God's children if they're not already. It's, it's a beautiful um, teaching that it comes out of Matthew 25. There's no question about it though, works are an important part of the picture, but only in the context of love for God and love for the people around us. So this leads to that Christian experience there transforming into a, a deeper walk with the Lord. Um, Wonderful verse on this subject that I often refer to is Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. Um, let's read it together. I think it's such an important verse. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And uh, the same writer in another book says, uh, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. A transformation has happened in this person's life. And this is what this German writer is particularly um, uh, getting at. Is he wants to emphasise this change, this transformation to becoming a, a, a living disciple of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
There's a, another important writer that we have access to can quote uh, in the context, and, um, and Alan White says, the good man or woman, from a generic point of view, the good person from the good treasure of the heart bring forth good things. Why? Because Christ is an abiding presence in the soul. The sanctifying truth is a treasure house of wisdom in all who practice the truth, as a living spring is springing up into everlasting life. The same writer says, if the heart, this is in Steps to Christ, we've been studying Steps to Christ on Tuesday nights uh, on, on a Zoom session, and we invite anyone to join in if you'd like to, if reference to that, if the link to it is in the bulletin, uh, sorry, right in the bulletin and in the um, uh, Pastor Gideon's on point. If the heart has been renewed by the Spirit of God, the life will bear witness to the fact. The life will bear witness to the fact. While we cannot do anything to change our hearts or to bring ourselves into harmony with God, we must not trust at all to ourselves or our good works. Our lives will reveal whether the grace of God is dwelling in us or not. A change will be seen in the character, the habits, the pursuits, the contrast will be clear and decided, and decided between what they have been and what they are now. The character is revealed not by occasional good deeds and occasional misdeeds, but by the tendency of the habitual words and acts to do to be all good. As we meditate upon the perfections of the Saviour, we shall desire to be wholly transformed and renewed in the image of his purity. There will be a hungering and thirsting of soul to become like him who we, whom we adore. The more our thoughts are upon Christ, the more we shall speak of him to others and represent him in the world. So that's the, what the result of transformation is, is, is people who are attracted to other people um, who are Spreading some of God's love and grace in uh, in, the, in the lives of the people that they meet around them. So um, John, sorry, uh, in looking at the work of the, this is all can only happen with the work of the Holy Spirit happening in our hearts and our lives. Um, and Jesus presents some very important teachings on the work of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14 and John chapter 16. In, in 14 he says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, read Holy Spirit, that he may abide, abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you, you believers, know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So what does this, this Holy Spirit who's going to be dwelling with us and in us, what's he actually, what activities is he doing when he's dwelling in us? John chapter 16. If I do not go away, the helper will not come. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, and he'll convict the world of righteousness and of judgment of sin, because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. <clears throat> There's a whole Bible study in that verse, those couple of verses there, encouraging us to understand the work of the Spirit in our hearts, and um, uh, if you uh, read a lot more into that German writer's um, um, writings, I hope you people are, might you know pick that up and read it. It's it's really worth it. Um, but <clears throat> have a think about it. The final little thought on that subject: if there is no spirit in our lives. There'll be no works and no transformation. 
sort of summarizes it up quite well. Do we need the Holy Spirit, or can we live without him? <laughs> without the Spirit of the Lord, we're unable to do anything. Could um, quote this one in Desire of Ages. It's another important long little quote here. He, or generically she as well, who would confess Christ must have Christ abiding in you. He cannot communicate that which he has not received. The disciples might speak fluently on doctrines, they might repeat the words of Christ himself, but unless they possessed Christ-like meekness and love, they were, were not confessing him. A spirit contrary to the spirit of Christ would be deny him, whatever the profession. Men may deny Christ by evil speaking, by foolish talking, by words that are untruthful or unkind. Everyone take note of these sort of things which are linked to denying Christ. They may deny him by shunning life's burdens, by the pursuit of sinful pleasure. They may deny him by conforming to the world, by uncourteous behaviour and by the love of their own opinions, by justifying self, by cherishing doubt, borrowing trouble and dwelling in darkness. In all these ways they declare that Christ is not in them. Strong words from the spirit of prophecy, um, but uh, very real on the, on the, the subject of what this, how do we need the spirit. We need the spirit to convict us of any and all of those things. And um, in John chapter 7, um, Jesus actually talks about what the Spirit will do, but he's bound by the fact that he hasn't ascended to heaven yet. And he, but he says there in that last line, um, by this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, that's all the people who will believe in Jesus, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So, in other words, wait there. But we are living in the time when, of course, the Holy Spirit is, is working. Another writing from the writings of Paul, he says in Ephesians chapter 1, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So there's a, a sealing of the Holy Spirit, there's a, a a permanentizing of the uh, your relationship with him. Um, and later on in the same book, Paul says, um, Ephesians 3, 16 and 17, Paul Pengo makes this little comment at the end of a, of a text, that he would grant you according to the riches of, of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and you, being rooted and grounded in love, is really describing what this presence of the, of the spirit in the, in the life is, is going to do. We really need him to do that. So, um, they talk about Christ and about the Holy Spirit. This is Ellen White commenting in Desire of Ages. But without surrendering the soul to be guided and controlled by the divine agency, we receive no benefit at all. Thank you. The, the, the key to this is that we need to ask for the Holy Spirit. We, he's not necessarily going to come unless we ask him to come into our lives. It's all got to do with recognizing our need of the Holy Spirit. So um, there's a wonderful promise in Luke chapter 11. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds. 
And to him who knocks, it will be opened. And uh, Jesus also, if a son asks, or a son or daughter asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer, will he offer him a scorpion? His parents wouldn't do that, would they? If then you be evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So who's, who's got the offer of receiving this Holy Spirit? We all do. Right down through the ages we can ask and we can, you know, he will receive it. So where do we ask? Does it come because we, we sign up to the church and become church members? Does it come because um, we, we do good works? <clears throat> It's all got to do with our prayer life and our um, relationship with Jesus and understanding his word. We're talking about engaging in, in prayer, meaningful prayer, frequent prayer, um, heart-searching prayer. We're talking about heart yearning, yearning with all of your heart and mind for, for a, a walk with the Lord through the presence of his spirit, selflessly submitting and relying on the spirit of the Lord for every area of our lives. Heart-searching prayer, heart-yearning prayer, selflessly opening our, submitting ourselves to the Lord in prayer and relying on the spirit of the Lord for every area of our lives. Keep asking. We need to keep asking, don't, don't just ask once, ask daily, every day. Our need for the Spirit of God is always there. And finally, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. May the Lord bless each one of you, each one of us, as we reflect on these things. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your presence with us. Thank you that we can trust our whole lives into a relationship with you. Now unto him who is able to keep you from fault stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Saviour, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.